Hello and welcome back. Uh, we are in module 2, part 2. In part 1 of this module, we have see, we have talked about, we have discussed about simultaneous bilingualism as to how children who learn both languages simultaneously in the environment, what are the uh, nuances within that, what are the different parts and what are the different theories and so on. So, now we will move on to the uh, second part of, uh, which is successive bilingualism. So, successive bilingualism as the name suggests is when one learns two languages in succession as in one language is learned first and then there is another language which is learned. So, in a sense this is the opposite of simultaneous bilingualism. So, the first most important thing is it is the opposite of simultaneous bilingualism. Similarly, there is uh, if you remember if you recall that in case of simultaneous bilingualism there is no first language and second language so to say both are first languages because both are simultaneously learned. But in this case there will be a first language and there is a second language as a result of which successive bilingualism is also called sometimes second language acquisition. So, successive bilingualism and second language acquisition are more or less the same thing which is when uh, one learns a language after another. So, what the first language is already in place and then there is a second language that one learns. In which case the first language will typically be the native language or the language of home, the dominant language and also the one which is most frequently used and it is the stronger language. By virtue of being the native language, by virtue of being the language first language or the one that you use at home and uh, for the um, better part of the day and so on naturally it is also the stronger language. In contrast the second language will be less dominant less frequently used and it is typically though not always it is also the weaker language. So, in the let us set the baseline first second language acquisition or successive bilingualism refers to a scenario where there is a first language already established which is the language of home which is the language of um, uh, major activities frequently used and so on it is already stronger and uh, then a new language comes in which is called the second language in this case. Now, technically speaking um, say successive bilingualism will uh, include every kind of bilingualism where, where one language follows another. So, it includes both children and adult learners because you see when um, already one language is in place and you are learning another language there can be you know any age bracket. First language is always learned in childhood in the in, uh, early part of your life, but second language can in you know, one can learn the second language at any time any point in time. So, there are uh, child children who learn a second language in childhood, uh, there are adults who learn and all the other age groups in between. So, uh, there are uh, these two primary types of uh, bilingualism with respect to second language acquisition. Now, when we talk about children um, as second language learners or adults as second language learners though they are part of one uh, broader category. However, there are some important differences between these two groups. Now, where are those differences? Typically, the difference will be in terms of the speed and accuracy of income uh, sorry accuracy of outcome. So, what does it mean in terms of speed? It means to it refers to how fast the acquisition of the second language happens, how quickly you learn, how quickly a child learns versus how quickly the adult learns. So, there are significant differences in terms of these two parameters in terms of successive bilingual. So, child children second language learners and adult second language learners are different on these two uh, uh, important uh, factors. Because of this primary factor age has become a very important variable to study. So, no matter whether one is studying ch uh, children as second language learners or adults as second language learner, age because of the uh, constant uh, inflow of data that show the differences between these two groups, age has become a very important issue to um, investigate and that is what we will see. Now, when we talk about age in terms of language uh, learning, there are certain very important um, issues to be resolved. First and foremost, let us um, 
talk about slightly about the nature of language. Well, how do we learn language? What is language? Right? So, many of you might be familiar with the nature nurture debate and also Chomsky's contribution in this regard. Chomsky was uh, the first linguist to claim that language is an innate faculty among uh, in humans. This is something unique and innate. So, he, the humans are different from all other languages because of all, all other uh, uh, animal species in terms of their linguistic capacity and he claimed that humans are born with the innate capacity to learn language. Now, if you compare uh, humans with other animals, uh, or every animal has their own innate capacities. For example, the various predators like lions and tigers and others, they need to learn their uh, the hunting techniques within a certain period of time within their life. Similarly, birds need to learn how to fly, right? There are similarly, many other factors in all animals. So, whatever, whichever capacity is innate that needs a very short time window after birth, postnatal life, in order for them to survive. So, if the bird does not um, learn to fly quickly, they will probably perish. Similarly, for all other animals. So, taking this as a standpoint, the theories within um, the, in the in the innateist um, hypothesis groups, they said that because language is also an innate faculty, this also needs to have a certain specific time window for to master that skill. So, this is where it all uh, starts from and the most uh, well known name in this regard is that of Eric Lenneberg who proposed in 1967 that automatic acquisition of language in natural settings can take place only within a particular time window just like any other animal has. Other animals have with respect to other innate faculties. In case of humans, there is this language faculty and this is the time window that he proposed. So, from age 2 years to puberty within this time frame, so primarily uh, roughly give and take a little bit 10 years. So, 10 years is the time within which humans um, need to pick up language. If they do not pick up language during that time, they will probably never master language. This is a very significant claim uh, put forward by Lenneberg. Now, this was initially used uh, for first language acquisition, later on it uh, was also used for second language acquisition. So, it initially this application was in first language, later on SLA also. Um, in fact, uh, around the time this theory was put forward, there were also some significant uh, discoveries. Now, for example, the discovery of, of um, feral children, some feral children, for example, the most famous case is that of Jenny who uh, was uh, discovered at the age around 13 of years of age and she had not learnt any language and she never probably mastered the language. Similarly, there was another case of Isabel who was discovered at a much earlier age and she, even though she also had no language till that point of time, she went on to learn language pretty well. So, these were certain instances where which seemed to prove the critical period hypothesis. So, this is what it is. So, this particular time window that uh, Lindenberg talks about later on was called, this is called critical period hypothesis. That period is called critical period and then uh, the, the hypothesis is called critical period hypothesis. There is a bit of disagreement among scholars. Some scholars prefer to call it a sensitive period rather than a critical period. But uh, nonetheless, the claim remains the same that um, there is a time window for humans to master language beyond which it becomes very difficult. Now, the reasons that were put forward were uh, like this. Most importantly, the theory was based upon neural development. So, the brain development of humans and uh, in terms of brain development, primarily they talked about brain maturation and uh, brain lateralization. Now, maturation is uh, the human brain develops even after birth. Uh, unlike many other animals, human brain de keeps developing for quite some time after birth. So, that is what is about brain maturation in terms of physical, physical development and maturation. At the same time, lateralization also takes place. Lateralization is in terms of specific localization of functions in the brain. So, which part of the brain takes care of which kind of functions and what are the connections that are to be made and how are those imp the various kinds of activities and schemas are imprinted on the human brain and so on. All of these are part of what is called lateralization. 
So, the claim was by the time uh, children uh, attain puberty, this is also the time when brain maturation and uh, lateralization also completes. So, once the brain lateralization and maturation has, uh, has taken place, once it is already in a rigid form, then a new any kind of new knowledge will be difficult to acquire. So, keeping that in mind, they had proposed the idea of critical period hypothesis. So, basically this goes, uh, this takes us back to the debate of uh, how rigid or flexible the human brain is. So, as far as critical period hypothesis goes, uh, it is this, this points to a largely uh, to a large, large amount of rigidity in terms of brain structure. However, recent research findings from neuroscience points to something entirely different that brain is remarkably plastic. In any case, that is a different uh, topic. So, initially CPH or critical period hypothesis uh, gained quite a bit of um, popularity and it seemed quite tenable. A lot of research findings also supported, I just talked about Ginny and Isabel, there are many other research uh, work as well. So, more or less this seemed to be the case, there was a clear difference in terms of age. So, children who started learning uh, language much later in life were, were found to be lacking in certain skills whereas, children who learnt it pretty early before the uh, critical period they were doing pretty well. However, by 1980s questions started to emerge because new research, new data started to emerge that questioned this. So, Many studies at, at during this time which compared children and adult second language learners on learning speed and ultimate attainment. Now, learning speed we have already talked about, ultimate attainment is something that, uh, that, that is basically the approximation of the native speaker's language proficiency. Earlier the uh, word used for this was native like proficiency, native like competence. So, a bilingual is uh, was considered high proficient bilingual or you know a perfect bilingual when he or she attains native like competence in the second language. Later on over a period of time it was realized that this will this probably does not happen and hence um, a new word was used. So, this is what it is uh, the ultimate attainment is what is now used for the highest amount of competence that the L2 learner can achieve. So, studies various studies um, involving children and adult learners. So, children and adult obviously the uh, primary difference here is in terms of age and they check them on speed as well as how far they have learned the language, how well they have learned the language. So, many um, studies were carried out, but one of the most uh, well known and among the earliest is this by Snow and of Nagel Hole. So, the subjects were the native speakers of English who went to Netherlands to learn Dutch language. Now, there were four groups of children, um, children ranging between 3 to 5, 6 to 7, 8 to 10 and, of, and then slightly older children who were 12 to 15 years. So, this older children were beyond the critical age and the other three groups were before the critical age. So, these are the four groups of English speaking children who went to Netherlands, stayed there for a year to learn Dutch language. Now, this was the results were the first ones to counter the claim that older learners do not learn as well as the uh, younger ones because the findings of the studies uh, showed that the older children were found um, the older children were found to uh, do better than the younger children there were many reasons to, that were put forward the one of them is that the older children uh, engage with the outside world more readily as opposed to the younger children and so on so there are various reasons put forward but the primary result remained that the older children were found to do better which is uh, which was one of the first counter counters to Lenneberg's theory of critical period. And similarly, there were also uh, new findings in neuroscientific neuroscience and that, um, that also questioned Lenneberg's most important claim on brain lateralization. So, this critical period was the hypothesis was largely hinged upon brain lateralization, but later studies uh, found that 
Lateralization actually completes much before puberty. It does not take that much of time. Uh, so, that timeline cannot be is not tenable even in terms of lateralization. So, both these initial findings were the first that question the critical period hypothesis. Similarly, yet another very influential study by Johnson and Newport 1989. This study was carried out on Chinese and Korean immigrants in US. Now, what they did was in this study very importantly the, there were many variables that they used not only age, but also one critical variable was the age of arrival in US. So, basically exposure to English language the number of years that these immigrants um, had spent in the US. So, which was basically a, a calculated up upon the age of arrival. So, this was one critical variable. However, this study was um, very important also in terms of the fact that they not only took in the variable of exposure of language, but also duration of stay, motivation, cultural identification and others. So, these are basically social variables and combining these various, vari various uh, variables and with the results, what they found was that the critical period hypothesis probably needs a relook. Now, before we go there, let us uh, see what the task was. The task was a grammaticality judgment. The subjects looked at uh, read various sentences and they had to judge whether the sentence is grammatical or ungrammatical. Right. So, this is a very simple uh, task of language competence and these are some examples. So, the farmer bought two pig at the market, the bat flew into our attic last night so on. So, these are the errors in the sentences and then also they had grammatical sentences. So, they had to uh, do a grammaticality judgment. Now, they found a very clear distinction in terms of age and performance. Most interestingly, there seemed to be a cutoff at age 16. So, this study found that the, the children who had arrived before age 16, the, the participants who arrived before age 16, their performance was correlated with the number of years spent in US. So, all those participants Chinese and Korean who came to the US before age 16, their, their performance on the task was correlated with the number of years spent. That was almost uh, there was a uh, generalized performance, generalized uh, data. But the, those people who arrived after age 16, there was a number of confounding variables. There were a number of variables that seemed to uh, predict the answer. There was not one variable unlike the first group. So, the result here was quite varied and they were correlated with factors like motivation and many others, how uh, outgoing they were, what kind of uh, groups they were and then the friend groups, the peer group and so on. So, basically the seem, there seems to be a difference at the at an age at 16. So, till an age certain, per, certain per variables work, after an age certain other variables work which has been explained by many other researchers as well because uh, the after 16 children are more outgoing and they have more uh, larger friend circle, they have, they have more um, social uh, activities and so on. So, chances are very high that they will learn language better, but at the same time it is that, that is also the time when uh, the, you know, the agency of the, of the individual has developed. So, individual tendencies of aptitude, attitude, motivation and various other such factors will play a strong role. So, these findings um, brought new questions to the, to the, to the theory of uh, critical period hypothesis. First and foremost, the cutoff age may not be fixed. In fact, it could probably be a continuum. It may not be a fixed cutoff after which it is not possible. It is possible provided the right kind of motivation and aptitude etc. are in place. So, basically the major finding is there are other factors other than age. So, age is not the only prime motivator uh, as opposed to critical period hypothesis. Critical period hypothesis does not say anything about other factors. It talks about only age, but now we see that age probably is a one factor, but alongside there are many others contributing agents as well. So, another uh, idea that was put forward by the researchers uh, from this study 
is what is called less is more hypothesis. Now less is more hypothesis has to do with the cognitive capacity of children versus, uh, versus older people. So children versus uh, adults or younger children versus older children and so on. What does this basically mean? It means that in among small children, children are um, they have less of many things, they have less cognitive capacity, they have less attention span, they have less interest in sustaining uh, focus on one particular thing and so on. As a result, what probably happens is and uh, the, the researchers call it the children are not overwhelmed by a new language as they do not over analyze. So, when um, after an age when you are slightly older and the language one structures are already in place, you have already some understanding and generalization about how languages work, then when a new language comes in, when a new, new structure comes in, we tend to generalize and that we try to see if our already established generalizations work or not. So, a lot of over analyzing the data so to say takes place in older people, older children and older adults and so on. However, for small children this does not happen because they, uh, the authors say that they children learn by uh, in, a, in a piecemeal way. So, whatever comes in they, they uh, keep to the surface, look at the input and learn it in a simplistic way because they do not over analyze. So, they perform only simple computations to the incoming stimuli and learn it. Hence, learning becomes much easier for children than for younger children than for uh, older people. Older learners may suffer from negative transfer. We have already talked about negative transfer um, before. Negative transfer is when your knowledge of first language affects your learning of second language. So, these are the reasons that were put forward by the study that why children are uh, learning better and which are not in that which do not have to do with the age as a as a in terms of brain lateralization, but age in terms of the cognitive strategies that children put in place which are different from the older. Uh, either older children or adults. Another idea that also came out from these um, studies is what is called entrenchment. Entrenchment is this put forward by Hernandez and McWhinney. This hypothesis says that the more the L1 gets established in the brain, the more entrenched it becomes in the system. Uh, let us take a simple example, um, how, how easy is it to teach an old person any new trick? Many of us have tried and failed to teach uh, you know how newer gadgets work to our grandparents uh, sometimes even to our parents. They uh, often they are not able to learn. The reason why they are not able to learn is not that they are idiots, they are not stupid. The reason why they do not learn is because there is a an internalized system, an entrenched system in place which refuses to budge. That is what is entrenchment. Same thing happens with language. So, when L1 has structure has been entrenched in the brain, when the structure has have already created a strong system in a strong system not only in terms of the language structure, but also in terms of the patterns, learned patterns. Many um, often uh, many researchers have uh, pointed out that language learning is to some extent in certain domains actually a pattern recognition um, system. So, those patterns that learned patterns have already been entrenched in the human brain. So, as a result a new system gets resisted. So, generalizations have been formed and there is a stable uh, neural system in terms of entrenchment in terms of the learned patterns and so on. And that is why it is difficult not because of age as a factor. So, here even though uh, they talk about neural systems becoming getting entrenched with one system, it is not in terms of lateralization, but in terms of pattern learning. So, the brain has learned one pattern and that you expect that same pattern to repeat every time and when it does not, then there is a resistance that is what it means. So, before entrenchment children can easily give up generalization because chil for small children the entrenchment is not strong. It is going through a process of entrenchment, but it is not yet strengthened. So, they can easily give up ok fine this is how it was for this, but uh, this is something new. So, they do not really care, but this does not happen after you get older. That is a very important point that has been put forward uh, uh, in the CPH um, literature. 
a very, very important theory again is McWhinney's um, unified competition model, the, which also tries to text, uh, take in take a, uh, to account for CPH. However, they also take various different kinds of variables, whether neural, cognitive, and social variables, because language does not function in a vacuum. Language is uh, simultaneously a cognitive mechanism, a social mechanism and a neural mechanism. So, taking all these things into account and this is pretty in, uh, recent 2012 when we have already understood a lot about language and its internal uh, architecture. Hence, the, this model takes into account all of these. Now, taking into account all of these factors, they propose some risk factors of language learning. These risk factors uh, affect older learners more compared to the younger learners. So, this is the idea of negative transfer. Negative transfer will be discussed in detail in another module. So, when we talk about conceptual transfer, entrenchment, we have already talked about entrenchment and then there is a, a similar idea which is called the parasitism on L1. Parasitism on L1 is nothing but trying to learn L2 through L1. So, once you have your L1 is established, strongly established, we try to learn L2 through L1 and that leads to negative transfer. So, this as a result negative transfers are called negative because this kind of a connection, this kind of a transfer of knowledge from L1 to L2 hinders the learning process that is why. And then mismatched connectivity, incorrect connections between processing areas in the brain because processing areas have already been entrenched, hence new connections do not match. And another important uh, point that they have mentioned is that of social isolation. Social isolation is a very important factor because language is ultimately a social uh, activity. So, if you do not have um, somebody with uh, you know the introvert, somebody who does not have a social circle, chances are very high that uh, one will not learn language. So, this model says that it is not that you know learning strategies are different between L1 and L2. Learning strategies are prim primarily similar. However, the differences arise because of these factors. They are no, not because languages are different, not because the strategies are different, but because of these factors which affect older people more compared to the younger people. So, in effect basically it is a dynamic interplay between competing languages and their connections to other factors. So, basically there are lots of factors responsible not just age. So, in terms of uh, critical period hypothesis we have seen there are different types of uh, findings and some of them corroborate, some of them uh, do not agree with this, some of them say that ok fine the theory seems uh, to have some merit. However, it needs to be tweaked, it needs to have a revisit in some domains. So, this is where we are as of today. Another factor in terms of uh, second language acquisition along with age is that of interaction. Interactionist uh, interaction and interactionist hypothesis. The interactionist hypothesis was uh, proposed a little later, but the, the, the genesis of this is from Stephen Krashen's uh, theory which is much, uh, much uh, earlier in 1977. So, what does Krashen say? Krashen's um, uh, contribution in second language acquisition is enormous and this is one such domain where his ideas have been uh, used. So, the primary points that uh, uh, Stephen Krashen made was a subconscious process of acquisition occurs when learner is focused more on meaning than on structure so to say. So, acquisition is referred uh, acquisition is used for first language acquisition when learning happens more automatically as opposed to in a formal setup. In a formal setup learning is more conscious, it is more tutored uh, um, and hence it is called learning. But in the in case of first language it is learned in the social setting, it is more naturalistic. So, that is what he said that even if it is a second language learning, if second language learning happens in a more naturalistic setting and there is a subconscious process focused on meaning then there is better uh, outcome is expected. Similarly, there has to be adequate comprehensible input 
this is a very important point that has been uh, taken up by later researchers as well. So, the input is very significant and has to be adequately comprehensible for the learners and of course, there should be enough simple codes whether it is the second language learning or foreign language learning in both cases simple codes help learning better. So, basically uh, starting with simple structures, simple vocabulary and gradually moving towards more complex structures. He does not give any role to production and says that production plays uh, no direct role in acquisition and um, interactions involving naturalistic uh, the child and adult learners are also important. So, basically he talks about input and interaction. So, this is where the, the motivation for interaction is hypothesis comes from. Two very important things the input which needs to be simple and it needs to be comprehensible and secondly there should be adequate amount of naturalistic interaction uh, between among the learners and between the learner and the others that is what uh, Krashen says. So, taking from there uh, interactionist hypothesis is how, however largely associated with uh, Michael Long's uh, report. There was a study um, on native speaker and non-native speaker uh, interview non-native speakers were all Japanese uh, learners. So, there was the English speakers and non-native speakers of English which were Japanese people and there was an in, uh, interview scenario. So, studying that scenario the, hypo, the report came out by uh, Michael Long and again he also stresses that which point the point that we already know that we have already seen in Krashen that comprehensible input is necessary for L2 acquisition. What does it mean? This almost sounds like um, uh, redundancy because when you are learning something new the input should be comprehensible. However, sometimes we do not really realize what is comprehensible from the non-native perspective. So, hence this, um, this focus is on this. Similarly, modifications to the interactional structure of conversation. So, this is where the interactionist hypothesis is based on. So, process of negotiating a communication. In a communication, there can be multiple problems, problems as in the conversation does not move forward because the non-native speaker has un, uh, trouble understanding various things. So, there will be a negotiation process going on through the conversation and the way those interactional um, structures are used will decide the outcome of the uh, language learning process that is what the, the in, interactionist hypothesis primarily says. So, the interaction between the learner and the uh, instructor or the native speakers or uh, various kinds of dyers have been used two native speakers, two non-native speakers, one native speaker, one non-native speaker various dyers have been uh, used in this kind of studies by different researchers. In all cases the focus has always been on the input quality of input comprehensible input and the kind of interactional strategies that the conversation participants use and based on that the uh, outcome are different. So, taking this conversation as a baseline data, there he finally puts forward some important uh, points as in uh, what decides the ultimate outcome. So, one is the input feature. Input features are of course, uh, purely linguistic features like vocabulary and sentence complexity and so on and interactional features are clarification request, confirmation check, self repetition. What happens I mean in uh, this does not have to be only in terms of second language acquisition. Even in a normal conversation there are many false starts. So, we realize because it is an auditory vocal loop of language use. So, we hear ourselves speaking, we realize we have said something wrong. So, we repeat ourselves or correct ourselves and so on. That is with yourself. But with the, in terms of a conversation, there are often clarification requests. So, is it this way? Should I say it like this or should I say it like that? So, on. confirmation check was it correct and this kind of things. So, modifications to the interactional structure can prove to be critical. So, if the uh, is interactional structures are not helping the learner to learn language learn properly, then there has to be a change in the interactional structure. This is where the theory underlines that input is important, but also important is the interactional strategy. 
Later on, uh, Terry Pika contributes significantly carrying this idea forward. Her, her contribution has been in, in designing experimental studies to verify. By the way, even uh, Long himself has said that not much um, uh, empirical data exists to support the international hypothesis. All the evidence that we have by this kind of interview uh, examples are basically uh, second, you know, secondary way of confirming. There are they are uh, not direct, they are indirect evidence. So, uh, Terry Pika start, uh, tried to create some experimental designs to test the claims of this hypothesis. By and large, she finds um, proof of the interactional hypothesis and broadly uh, there is an agreement. However, more important contribution of Pika lies in extending the hypothesis, extending in a uh, in the social domain. So, so her studies in, uh, underlines the importance of social relationship between participants as determinants in the interactions. So, learners and interlocutors because in a conversation where you have a native speaker teaching a non-native speaker their second language, there is already a hierarchical structure. The native speaker already obviously knows better than the non-native speaker. So, this is an unequal uh, situation, the, the, they are not equivalent. However, Pika says that even though that, that inequality is a given in that conversation scenario, in the interaction scenario, in, in that kind of a, uh, you know negotiation uh, in the communication process, they should assume equivalent status. Only, and that is that will go a long way in ensuring success of the teaching program in learn, teaching learning program. So, this they should interlocutors should behave like equivalence with the learners. So, if I am teaching uh, my uh, for my native language to somebody for whom it is a non-native language, both of us I should behave like an equivalent to him or her in order to um, in order for the conversation to have better results. This is what uh, she says. In more recent times, Oliver uh, also has worked on in this area and tried to see if children and adults have different interaction strategies in various uh, scenarios. So, they check, checked how if and how children negotiated for meaning, the strategies they used for getting clarifications on meaning and then if these interactions are different for children and adults. So, if there is a difference between adults and children. So, they found that these are the strategies that typically children use for getting to for negotiation, negotiating meaning in a conversation setup, in an interaction setup. So, clarification request, confirmation checks, comprehension checks and repetitions like we have uh, seen in the earlier studies also. So, this has been confirmed. However, they, uh, another interesting aspect of the finding was that children use fewer comprehension checks compared to adults. Based on various findings, Long updated uh, the interaction hypothesis and they, he included that the he included the role of negative feedback, negative evidence. So, we only we already know that positive, inf uh, positive evidence has a positive uh, impact, but it is also important to include the negative evidence, what is not possible in L2. Very often L1 structure is carried over to L2 and but we need to be told that this particular structure is not possible. So, that is something that he uh, has updated and in included in the in the hy hypothesis. Now, all these findings uh, with respect to age and interaction hypothesis have now been combined to study uh, language acquisition and also in turn it has been utilized in pedagogical practices and strategies all over the world. So, because any one feature is not uh, useful, the both of these features have turned out to be very significant and hence they have been um, uh, utilized. So, many differences have been found in L2 ultimate attainment of older children based on longitudinal studies. So, this is one uh, domain of study that have uh, typically taken into account both of these uh, variables as we just mentioned longitudinal studies. So, studying children over a period of time. So, often another parameter has been uh, pointed out uh, in this kind of studies uh, is that the language preferences 
So, here we bring in the individual parameters, age is act one objective factor, interactional strategies is another factor, however, language preference also emerges as another indicator of differences in attainment. So, one quite an influential study by G. I. Aronson 2003, they studied um, uh, study over 3 years in an English as second language setting and the subjects were Chinese children there were 6 young kids and there were 4 adolescents ok. There were 2 age groups of Chinese students learning English in the second language setting and they found out that this the differences in the ultimate attainment between these 2 groups could be understood in terms of language preference. So, not all children not all children, groups of children prefer to learn the second language or you know there is a preferential treatment given to L1 versus L2 and so on. So, while the younger children switch their preference to English in the first year, the older ch children maintained a preference for Chinese even after 3 years. So, this I think takes us back to the study that uh, found out that that talks about the entrenchment factor because smaller children had the Chinese was not yet entrenched so strongly and hence their preference for English shifted very quickly. But for older children the preference for English did not really uh, take place in tune with the younger kids for them Chinese remained the preferred language and that so if you have no if you do not prefer to learn it will be very difficult to learn. So, that is that is why language preference has been found to be an interesting predictor. Another is the foreign language setting. So, a lot of studies have uh, looked at uh, foreign language setting versus second language setting because the teaching strategies are different. So, they have another, uh, another study uh, looked at foreign language setting for children who began learning L2 at different ages. Now, they show that even after same hours of instruction, so foreign language versus second language, even if they had same number of hours uh, for instruction, late beginners show advantages over those who started earlier, right. So, here we have yet another parameter that muddies the water further. The amount of input and practice that the children were exposed to in the foreign language setting were predicted to be the reason. So, you see we are gradually moving towards yet another predictor which is the stress setting whether English is taught as a second language versus whether English is taught as a foreign language. The moment we change from say second language setting to foreign language setting teaching strategies change which basically means differences in terms of input and practice and as a result of which there were significant amount of differences. So, quality of input and not age seems to be a factor that came out of studies a large number of studies as you can see here I have uh, mentioned a few of them here. So, quite a few studies have found out this kind of a pattern. So, this brings us to the differential instructional settings and the type of learners. So, we have already seen that foreign language versus second language setting could be a strong predictor of the outcome. Then the reason one is of course, the input practice session and so on. Another important uh, difference between foreign language versus second language setting is the exposure to the language that is being learned. So, what happens in a foreign language setting it is typically taught in a classroom and there is no access to the language outside the classroom which may not always be the case for the second language. Second language even if it is being taught in a classroom scenario chances are there that you probably will be able to learn the language outside the class as well in the pe in peer group in school in colleges in various other settings and so on. So, that means that exposure uh, differential exposure to the language right. So, uh, this is one among the other other variables that are different between uh, foreign language setting and second language setting and of course, um, differential strategies that are uh, there depend, depending on these two. So, programs like content based education, theme based language teaching and CLIL these are some of the uh, 
new ways of teaching language that have come out come up with uh, all this um, keeping the foreign language con uh, condition foreign language setting in mind so foreign language setting uses different uh, different types of um, uh, teaching programs some of them are this so initially content based teaching mainly involved teaching grammar However, over time it has now started to use context also because teaching a language through grammar is well grammar is important but teaching a language through only grammar cannot uh, really prepare somebody for using it in the real life context and hence over a period of time content based edu uh, education instruction has uh, undergone a lot of change and they have moved from uh, only grammatical to grammatical plus context based. So, there, uh, there are various types of these methods, but typically the focus is to immerse the learner in that language context, context of use. This is one of the, uh, the CLIL is among the uh, most recent and quite popular uh, way of uh, using this, this kind of method of uh, immersing the learners in an environment. It is used uh, in across various European countries now. So, what is CLIL? CLIL basically is an educational approach where curricular content is taught through the medium of a foreign language. So, imagine me uh, going to Japan um, and studying masters there um, and I am and let us say I am doing masters there. So, master subjects will be taught to me in Japanese. So, I am learning the content as well as the language at the same time. This is what CLIL primarily does. So, typically students will um, perform uh, participate in some form of mainstream education at the primary, secondary or tertiary level. There are different levels and different curricula for that, but the idea is that subjects will be taught in that target language. Now, because the lots of schools, lots of uh, educational institutes have adopted CLIL method, so we have now uh, quite a bit of data to go by as to uh, what has happened, what happens and what are the results of these uh, processes. So, type of interaction the learners engaged is different in CLIL as opposed to mainstream teaching and then there are CLIL learners produced fewer negotiating strategies compared to mainstream learners. Learners also used L1 to a lesser extent and the many other findings have been put forward. So, CLIL learners also receive more hours of instruction because they are not only teaching the language, but they are teaching subjects, other subjects through that language. So, naturally the number of instruction, number of hours for instruction is also pretty higher and they also have, they receive more meaningful um, input. So, these are some of the findings with respect to these uh, research, uh, researchers that have uh, pointed out the differences. Immersion programs are also similar programs, but there are slight differences between immersion and CLIL um, and, and this also is pretty uh, much older than uh, CLIL. CLIL is, uh, was, uh, is used primarily for foreign language teaching, but immersion programs have existed. Uh, for different kinds of purposes uh, sometimes to teach also local languages. So, it is not only a foreign language teaching mechanism and uh, one significant uh, in, uh, difference between CLIL and immersion is that in immersion the teachers are also bilingual which is not the case in CLIL. So, I will be teach, I will be taught by a Japanese monolingual person let us say. So, teachers are bilingual and the uh, starting age for immersion also is typically earlier than CLIL. So, depend concerning the types of input and feedback, the they maximize opportunities for L2 development. So, uh, it was also found that learners develop better metalinguistic uh, awareness and they did much better in terms of target language acquisition. However, there are differences even within the immersion programs. So, nothing is monolithic, even CLIL has the, their own differences uh, which we did not get into here. Immersion program also has uh, various layers. So, patterns of feedback, interactional feedback, uptake and repairs, they all might differ depending on the participants. So, there were studies comparing French and Japanese uh, learners in an immersion uh, process in the fourth and fifth grades and they found that the the, the two, two communities, two children coming from French and Japanese backgrounds, they differ. So, now we have yet another variable to predict the outcome of learning process that is the characteristics of the learners. Instructional context we have already seen, now we have the learners characteristics. 
Yet another uh, approach was taken up, this is largely um, attributed to Swain. His work explored the patterns of interaction, international characteristics, various uh, kinds of uh, socio-pragmatic indicators like turn taking, topic development, self evaluation and so on. So, these are all socio-cultural perspectives and they have utilized it in looking at childhood SLA. So, for example, they, this one particular study looked at Chinese EFL learners. This is EFL English as foreign language learners in the 4th and 6th grades and the results showed that 4th graders showed less degree of engagement and their patterns of interaction were also not stable across tasks. So, there are various kinds of um, possibilities, there are very as we have already noticed now age, interaction, interactional strategy, strategies uh, based on whether the language being taught is taught as a second language or as a foreign language. Even within foreign language are you looking at CLIL type of um, teaching method versus you are using immersion method. In, in all of these cases the various socio-pragmatic factors, various individual factors like the characteristics of the learners so on and so forth. There are so many variables that could predict the outcome of a language learning scenario in children. And last but not the least, there has been another approach to the problem to understand the problem of understanding um, the various nuances of child language acquisition, second language acquisition among children is that of using children themselves as researchers. So, this was put forward by Pinter in 2014 because until and unless you have somebody from within the group, it is probably slightly more difficult to understand what is happening. So, including children in this um, in this group could be useful. So, uh, they use uh, questionnaires to assess children's own viewpoint and turns out that uh, often the results have been quite positive that children do, um, they are capable of understanding, they do understand uh, their own development. So, they have been uh, asked to assess themselves and it seems that they, they are aware, children are aware and hence they can be part of the research uh, understanding, there are research um, programs. Now, we will move on to second language acquisition among adults. So, this um, second language acquisition from uh, on in adults have been a rather uh, common topic for a very long time. Uh, it has gone through its own uh, trajectory of changes uh, across time. Uh, there were social linguistic approaches, there are uh, applied linguistic approaches and also there are cognitive and psychological um, approaches to this problem, to this to understanding what happens. So, various domains they use uh, various predictors like uh, aptitude, individual differences like motivation and so on. Uh, but in terms of psychological and cognitive uh, perspective, again the main pointers, main uh, variables in this uh, domain also is um, age and input. Age we have already talked about adequately, we have already seen the various theories and the counters to those theories. So, we will not go there again, uh, we will just add on slightly there. Uh, in terms of there are few arguments that have been put forward uh, in terms of adult second language acquisition. One is that comparison between children and adult does not make any sense because the, the amount of input are not same because a child this is irrespective of the age factor. So, a child by virtue of becoming by virtue of being a child learner has automatically a larger amount of time to him to him or her to get input the adults have much lesser in terms of decades probably. So, an adult learner already misses out and hence there cannot be any comparison. That is one very strong argument given in terms of uh, why adult learners and children learners should not even be compared. Secondly, on theoretical ground, it has been already been seen that it is not the case that adult learners will not master the grammar. In fact, now, they, now we know that grammar is also not a monolith. The language structure, language representation and language and the grammar of it, the structure of it also have subsystems. So, whereas some aspects of grammar may not be uh, possible to master at a later age, but certain other domains can be. So, now we have a better understanding in terms of this. So, which aspect of grammar are more resistant and which are not. So, there is um, the research findings uh, say that no critical period exists for learning 
phrasal semantics for example. So, this is one domain of grammar that does not depend on the age. However, certain other um, areas like functional morphology or syntax um, discourse interface, these are some domains which seem to have an uh, age correlation, uh, meaning that there is a bottleneck expected in this kind of domains, however, many other domains do not. So, it is not that uh, an adult learner will never learn language like a child learner, the adult learner might master the language except in certain grammatical conditions. So, this is the logic. Another um, a serious, a serious counter to this um, to the current CPH in terms of adult uh, SLA is the bilingual turn. Bilingual turn primarily refers to the, um, the theoretical uh, change, change of standpoint in bilingualism research where the now it is an established truth that the bilingual should not be and cannot be taken as two monolinguals. So, a bilingual is a differently entirely different creature and it is not a coming together of two monolinguals that is not how it works. So, the bilingual second language should not be like another another monolingual. So, monolingual speaking the L2 it is not like that. So, a bilingual is a completely different kind of person and there should be no comparison with monolingual controls and the, they say that in the whole of second language acquisition it should not be this is uh, SLA second language acquisition, uh, but particularly in terms of critical period hypothesis related research because they are the, the, the underlying structures are different. And also neuroscience data shows that bilingual uh, experience has a strong impact on the neural pathways which are different uh, in case of monolinguals. So, it is not only the language learning strategies or practices, but also at the neuronal level there are differences, significant differences between monolingual and bilingual and hence comparing them is not uh, tenable. Input also, there are um, all the findings with respect to children also hold for adults. However, there is another interesting take on this that um, that has been found out that if the input has variability, then this also creates a problem. Variability as in let us say certain um, grammatical structures could be variably used in the society. For example, the, there is a lot of ambiguity or variability. For example, a particular study on Spanish. So, Chilean Spanish versus Mexican Spanish, um, this study was carried out on this both the languages are Spanish. Now, in case of Mexican Spanish, the plural is overtly realized like in English with an S. So, when uh, with the plural noun, the S comes in as a, as a suffix and so plural is overtly realized in all conditions. Nouns, adjectives and determiners. So, plural marker comes on all of these. In Chilean Spanish, there are of course, social linguistic variations this piece of inflectional morphology undergoes a regular process of lenition to aspiration to nothing. What basically this means is that this realization of the overt realization of the plural marker is subject to variation in terms of socio social variation versus various kinds of other factors. So, the, this realization can happen in different ways. So, plural morphology is not completely absent, but it is rendered unreliable because it is subject to variability, subject to variation depending on various factors. So, the same language the Spanish when it is spoken in Mexican, so the Mexican Spanish has one way of looking at it, Chilean Spanish takes it a little more lightly let us say and they have variations of that same grammatical particular property and as a result of which. Chilean Spanish is more uh, less reliable as an input as opposed to Mexican Spanish and the results also support that both younger and older Mexican children were significantly more accurate because in case of Mexican Spanish the variability does not exist. So, input if there are variations in the input and if and, and thereby the input becomes unreliable that also will affect the outcome. 
Another uh, quite recent um, theoretical position in uh, language learning is that of complex adaptive system. Now in this approach language is regarded not as one single uh, thing but it is also treated as a complex system which is dependent on uh, or involving uh, various multiple agents. Language is not insulated from other practices and that is why it is called complex adaptive system. So this system is adaptive because it uh, the speaker's behavior is based on their past experiences, experiences not in terms of um, experiences in terms of creating the mental representations of all those experiences and their neural representations and so on. So the structure of the language emerged from interacting patterns of these experiences, social interaction, general cognitive processes and so on. This is a very um, quite an important uh, theoretical position and we will come back to it later when we discuss language processing in bilinguals. However, uh, this, this also remains an important standpoint in terms of language acquisition as well. So, we will discuss more on this. The theory goes to, the theory is uh, was proposed by Filippo Witt and Hawkins. And then of course, um, there is the, the processing based uh, studies, the data that we have from processing based studies that look at the native speakers competence versus the bilinguals competence in terms of processing language. So, processing language uh, basically is hinged on two points, two primary um, claims that second language is processed the same way as first language. The, com the opposite claim is that second language is processed differently compared to first language. So, the difference basically is in the, the claim that says first and second language are processed similarly which also means it is learned similarly. The claims that the difference that we see is basically quantitative and not qualitative. Qualitatively they are similar and the opposite hypothesis say that it, there is a qualitative difference and this hypothesis is called shallow structure hypothesis and they claim that there are qualitative differences in uh, between L1 and L2 uh, users. Now shallow processing says that shallow processing as the name suggests is the processing strategy that is used by bilinguals is based on based more on lexical knowledge pragmatic routine and basic argument structure but the the deeper understanding of the language and deeper understanding of the structural properties are missing right and in the um, semantic processing is favored rather than deep knowledge of syntactic rules that is the claim so there are two claims one is that the processing based understanding has two ways of looking at it one group says that there are no differences in processing strategy other says there is a difference what is the difference that bilinguals use a shallow processing strategy as opposed to monolinguals monolinguals use a deep processing strategy where they uh, exhibit their understanding of the deeper syntactic rules. Now this theory has also faced some criticism uh, uh, most importantly uh, from studies that looked at low educated, low reading span and non-proficient native speakers. What they found was that even if you are a native speaker you can still use uh, an approach that is typical of second language learners which is the shallow uh, processing hypothesis. So, uh, shallow processing can be utilized even by native speakers if they are low educated, they have low reading and they have less proficient. So, uh, this is but basically ultimately a matter of exposure than to whether it is first language or second language. So, an illiterate uh, first language speaker even though the spoken uh, variety should could be quite adequate however, because the, that person has not been exposed to larger um, usages of the language or more com 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 uh, complex uh, structures of the language, they will not be able to process. So, ultimately it comes down to exposure and not whether it is L1 or L2. So, basically second language acquisition strategies or second language processing strategies are not anything significantly different. So, one particular study involving Greek English bilinguals, um, they used either naturalistic or classroom uh, exposure to English and found that naturalistic learners were indeed processing the intermediate level intermediate traces which are complex grammatical structures like native speakers. So, what this is another angle to the same story that the, the kind of 
scenario kind of setting in which the language is learnt, the kind of exposure the learners have had whether it is a natural setting versus it is a classroom setting that could also be an important uh, pointer in this regard. So, these are some of the nuances that exist with within the second language acquisition research. This is a uh, quite a large area of research very difficult to you know include everything in this, but these are the main factors that have been uh, looked at in this domain. And so, in conclusion we can say that uh, factors like type of exposure naturalistic versus classroom uh, and along with all the other factors of age, input, interaction strategies and so on, experience with complex language constructions etc. can be a good predictor for a, um, the variation between L1 and L2 processing and thus learning. So, this is uh, these are some of the references uh, all the papers that I have talked about are all may included here. So, this is where we complete the language acquisition second language acquisition in uh, both children and adults. Mm -hmm.